First come, first serve. If you want some tomatoes, all you have to do is touch base with Michael. All right, there you go. Can't beat it right there. Forget the farmer's market. We just got it going on right here. All right. There is a lost and found table out there. Going once, going twice, gone. Uh, there's stuff that's been here for a long time, and I'm not going to mess with it much longer. So if you walk past today and you say, that's not mine, or that might be mine, it doesn't really matter to me. It's going to Goodwill this week. So catch it if you can, all right? Huh? It's out on the table in the foyer. I mean, like you have to about walk over it. To yeah. <laughs> in fact, somebody could just move it around so you have to walk around it. Maybe that would be the answer, and you'd still say, I didn't see it. I didn't see that table with the sign on it that says lost and found. All right, okay. Now, finances. Just wanted to give you just a real quick update on some things. Bottom line is times are tough right now, right? We all know it. I mean, everything has escalated and costs are going up, and they have been as we have been doing this remodel. I, I would just, I mean, I can't even believe the costs of, of materials. Uh, when we first started a year and a half, two years ago with sheets of OSB, I think they were 18, 19 bucks, and then at one point we paid $72 a sheet to do the opposite wall where we were putting windows in. Costs are awful. We know that. Everybody's uh, there, and we understand that. Um, but bottom line is, I just wanted to share this with you. I mean, last year versus this year, kind of a midsummer, June 30th, if you will, snapshot. Uh, I mean, we are down in terms of our giving. Our giving's off about $14,000, but our expenses are also down about 16000 So we've been trying to toe the line with expenses but giving is down. There's been extras that been, has been given towards the, the future growth fund. Uh, but again, it's just it's taking more than we would have thought because every time I go to or, order material like flooring, I put a down payment on some stuff about a year ago, and going back to reorder some more of that, costs have doubled. And so that's just where we're at. But bottom line is that half of that building really needs to get done. It just does. I think your pastor would be very happy if we could just get it done. Uh, that would be a monkey off my back for sure. Uh, and everyone else that's working in that area. So here's the deal. Um, you know, the roof was an absolute gift from the Lord in terms of how that all worked out. But there were still extra costs involved there. You know, when we did not anticipate doing the whole roof, but yet we ended up doing the whole roof. There were sheeting costs and all those kinds of things. So here's the clear picture in terms of moving forward of what we need to do to solve that issue in the back. There's about eight to $10,000 more that we need to put into the flooring and the rest of the stuff to finish that half of the building. And that would make it completely usable for, I mean, it's usable, we're using it now, but it would just make it efficient and clean. Uh, and we're right now about 20000 in our, uh, our future growth fund, so you can see it's dwindling fast. So, just wanted to give you that picture, wanted to get you uh, kind of an update. Um, again, I'm not here saying uh, that, that any of us are not sacrificing, because I know you are. Many of you are sacrificing, and we're giving, and we're giving, and we're giving. And I know that bottom line is, one of the things that we've been learning, even in our time of what does the Bible say about worship, that sacrifice is involved when you worship. And that means physical, that means financial, that means everything. Um, every time I read through the Old Testament, I am amazed at the amount of sacrifice they would make unto the Lord in worship. Incredible amounts of sacrifice. I mean, not just one lamb or one, uh, one animal. It was thousands and thousands that they would sacrifice unto the Lord and give Him their very best. So I'm just encouraging you, just... As we pray, as we look to the Lord, He is our provider, but that's where we are and uh, would love to see us finish this out so that we can kind of get a little bit of breath and begin to figure out where we're going to go next. Amen? All right, so why don't you stand with us this morning again? Have any questions, feel free to see me, uh, talk to me. Uh, we have... Uh, 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 other people who are on our board, we haven't met in a good while, but... Um, Bottom line is, is we're doing our best to, again, like I said, hold expenses 
keep everything as clean as we can and continue to serve the Lord in this ministry here. Uh, but it does cost money to do ministry. So, good to see you. Get that breath out. Let's pause. Take a deep breath. And allow the Lord to minister to us this morning. Amen. Father, we thank you that we are able to come freely and worship you. The main thing that kept us from doing anything this morning was probably just our own weariness. There are no obstacles. We have tremendous freedom to worship you right now in this country, and we thank you for that. I pray that we would never, ever take that for granted. So as we have this complete and open and free environment this morning, we look to you, our God, Jehovah, our provider. Lord, you heard the conversation. You know the needs of this church. You know the needs of every family in this church. You know the needs even before we ask them or talk to you about them. One of the things that we know that your word tells us is that you are Jehovah Jireh. My God, our God, shall supply all our need according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So we look to you not only just for provision, for financial and material things, but God, more than anything, we look to you for the spiritual food that we need this morning and for the manna from heaven that you give so freely. We pray that your spirit would hover over this place and minister life and hope and encouragement and strength and healing. We love you. We honor you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.
was buried beneath my shame who could carry that kind of weight it was my tomb till I met you I was breathing
been such a fun week of worship in different ways. <laughs> From last week, Pastor Randy mentioning, like, when he goes to heaven, he wants to sing Build My Life. <laughs> and that just mental picture that you gave us last week was so much fun. Um, to I was at a half American, half Nigerian wedding on Friday, and it was so much fun. And we danced, you know, as you do at a wedding, but we danced to Nigerian worship music. And just the joy and the exuberance and dancing and singing, I didn't know the words, but dancing and singing with Nigerian brothers and sisters, just in complete joy to the, to the Lord and just not caring what anyone else thought, but moving with your whole body and singing with your whole voice with others in unity with people who didn't really speak your language was just such a wonderful picture of worshiping in heaven. Like, <laughs> my mom mentions this all the time of, oh, when I go to heaven, I hope we sing the song. Or, you know, I hope this person is there leading worship. And just this idea that everything that we enjoy here on earth about worship is going to be a hundred billion times better when we get to heaven. Right. And so my sister... Emily showed me the song this past week, and I loved it because it, it encapsulates that mental picture of endless praise forever to the one who deserves it all. So it's a new song, but I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Just to bow down before your throne, see your face, I'll cry out because you're holy, holy, holy are you, Lord.
worthy, 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 Lord, another glimpse of glory. We'll sing once more. Worthy, 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 Lord, forever. Worthy, 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 Lord, another glimpse of glory. We'll sing once more. Jesus, we can't wait to join the chorus that they've been singing for ages. That you are holy, holy, holy. That you are worthy of our praise. You're worthy to open the scrolls. You have conquered death. Jesus, I pray this morning as we take some time to get into your word, that you will move in this room, that you will touch people where they're at, that you will show them a new revelation of your character, something that's always been in your word that we've just overlooked, that we haven't understood, God, that you would move in a way that you would give us knowledge that only comes from you. Jesus, we worship you. We are so grateful for what you have done. We are so grateful for you being our high priest and making a way for us to be redeemed to our Father. We are so thankful that you conquered death. You called us by name and all you asked for in return is our worship. We 
love you and we pray that you will stay here with us. You will continue to move in the room. We ask these things in the mighty, powerful, worthy, holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You guys can be seated. So this morning we're going to continue with our talks on what does the Bible say about, and we are sticking with worship. I'd like to do something a little different than what we've done so far. What I'd like to do is I'd like to look at a couple of examples of worship in Scripture. What's up, Kennedy? It's good to see you. See a couple of examples in Scripture of what worship looks like. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what worship looks like in the church and what it looks like for us. And then we're going to talk about why there seems to be a little bit of a difference there. And we'll, we'll get into all that, so let's kind of take a breath. I want this to um, not really feel as much like a sermon this morning as much as I want it to just feel like a brother in Christ speaking to brothers and sisters in Christ. And the reason I say that is because we're going to be kind of focusing on a lot of what Paul says and a few of his letters and how one letter that after studying it and hearing a sermon on it and, and getting some background on it, it really kind of changed a huge perspective for me when it comes to worship. So I want you to hear my heart in that this morning. This in no way, shape, or form uh, is supposed to be like me shaking my fist at you guys. I'm in this with you. But I really want to dig into this and see if there's anything here that we can grab that we can hold on to, that we can learn from, that will change how we look at worship. So first, let's start with a few examples of worship. One of my favorite examples is of Paul and Silas when they're in jail. Let's look at Acts 16, verses 22 through 34. I'll give you a little bit of backstory. Um, there was a person and a lady who um, she had, she kind of had this... Uh, I don't want to call it a scam, but that's really kind of what it was, of uh, telling fortunes and getting people's money for it. Um, she was a, a servant, and her master made all the money, and he gave her a cut for the fortunes that she would tell. Uh, long story short, as soon as she saw Paul, uh, she recognized the Holy Spirit that lived in Paul, and she wouldn't stop bothering him until Paul literally looked at her and said, Jesus, get this demon out of this woman. And then when that happened, she no longer told fortunes, and her master got mad because he was no longer making money off of her. So immediately they took him to uh, court, and he got arrested for it. So we're picking up there. The crowd joined in on the attack on Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Okay. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into a prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was, a, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and once all the prison doors, all the prison doors flew open. And everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights, and he rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and to all the others in, the, in his house. At that hour of night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all of his household were baptized. 
The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. There's a couple of things that stand out to me here when we look at biblical worship and what happens when biblical worship takes place. One, I've talked about this before. It says that they were put in the inner cells. Okay, So they were beaten with rods. They were their flogged, rods flogged severely. And after that, it says that they were put in the inner cells. The inner cells were not only for, uh, they were like extra guarded, they were the like most center part of the prison, but they're actually torture chambers. So they were severely beaten, and then who knows what all happened within the inner cell. The beatings probably continued. And in the midst of all that, they began to worship. So the first thing that sticks out to me in biblical worship is that it takes place regardless of circumstance. Regardless of what they're dealing with, he, they were being beaten and tortured, and yet they saw the goodness of God. They saw God's faithfulness to the point to where they started singing out songs and hymns to their God. The next thing that sticks out to me in this story is that when biblical worship takes place, God makes his presence known. There's a promise that where two or more are gathered, there I am also. So they begin worshiping despite their circumstances, and God shows up in a very, very profound way. But this is the part that I think is the most exciting to me. When biblical worship takes place, people are worshiping regardless of circumstance, and God shows up and makes his presence known. And then men are brought to salvation. Notice it said, at that, at that moment, whenever the foundations were shaken, not just Paul and Silas, Everyone's chains were loosened. Not just Paul and Silas, everyone in the prison was set free. Obviously, the jailer came to him and said, what must I do to be saved? He was going to kill himself because in that time, they were responsible for prisoners. So if a prisoner got away, that was their life. They were supposed to go in their place. So he was about to kill himself, and yet none of the prisoners left. They were so compelled by what just happened, they wanted to know more about this God that Paul and Silas were singing to. The jailer, too, asked him, what must I do to be saved? Now, I don't know about you this morning. I don't know how you feel um, about our normal worship services. I think we're blessed with the worship team that is very talented and very devoted. I think we are blessed with a pastor who has done a really good job of creating an awesome atmosphere for free worship to take place and for it to be safe for us to worship. That being said, wouldn't you love to go to a church where every Sunday morning people were worshiping regardless of circumstance Every Sunday morning, God made his presence known, and every Sunday morning, people were coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Every Sunday morning, biblical worship breaks out. God shows up, and people get saved. Another one of my favorite uh, examples of worship in the Bible that has nothing to do with music is the widow's offering. Let's look at Mark 12, verses 41 through 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. 
But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, copper coins being the smallest amount of, uh, the, the smallest kind of coin in circulation, the smallest amount of money that she could have done. Two of those worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out their wealth. They all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything. All she had to live on. When I read that story, I'm reminded of regardless of the fact that we may be blessed with a good worship team, regardless of the fact that we've been blessed with a pastor that has created a safe place for us to worship and express worship freely, regardless of all that. As far as Jesus is concerned, the value of our offering is only ever equal to what it cost us. The value of what we offer to him, the value of our sacrifice is only ever equal to what it cost us to give it to him. We see this all throughout scripture. I think my favorite example of this is in 2 Samuel 24 where a plague had taken over the nation of Israel and David's king at the time. 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 18 you see, on that day, Gad went to David and said to him, Go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aranah the Jebusite. So David went up as the Lord had commanded through Gad. When Aranah looked and saw that the king and his officials were coming towards him, he went out and bowed before them, bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Aranah said, why has my lord the king come to his servant? To buy your threshing floor, David said, the threshing floor being the place where you would build an altar. So I can build an altar to the lord that this plague on the people may be stopped. And Arna said to David, let my lord the king take whatever he wishes and offer it up. Here are oxen for the burnt offering and here are the, the threshing sledges and, and ox, oaks, or ox yokes Take everything that you need. Your majesty, Arana gives all of this to the king. May the Lord your God accept you. But the king replied, this is David speaking, no, I, ins I insist on paying you for it. Why? Because I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. I will not sacrifice to the Lord offerings that didn't cost me anything. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. David built an altar to the Lord there and he sacrificed the burnt offerings and a fellowship offering. Then the Lord answered his prayer on behalf of the land, and the plague on Israel was stopped. David points out very clearly, I am not going to offer something to God that didn't cost me anything. There's a theme we're starting to see in biblical worship. It seems like biblical worship looks way more desperate than how it does on a Sunday morning in America. We look at how the same guy, David, talks about worship and talks about 
sacrifice and offering. He says something else about offerings in Psalm 51, 16 through 17. He's speaking to God and he says, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. I was looking at these examples of biblical worship and I was asking, why does it seem so much more desperate than how we worship on a Sunday morning. And I don't mean just us, I mean church capital C. What, what worship looks like, what we've all experienced at different churches, why in the Bible does it look so much more desperate than it does today? Let's think about how church looks. We come in, we catch up with our friends, we hear the latest announcements and decide what we can and can't fit into our schedule. We sing some songs. Our passion is often determined by the song list and how well the worship team did. We show up ready to be blessed by the worship team and by a sermon from Pastor Randy and by whoever's serving in house that morning. We take notes that eternally live as bookmarks in our Bibles, but never actually take on skin and get worked out in our lives. They're just friendly little reminders on paper of something that God told us needed to change at one point in time. We close out with prayer or worship, and our response is often determined by how into the message we were, whether it tickled our pride, whether it made our minds happy, whether we agreed with everything that was said, whether there was a heartfelt story and we got our weekly cry in. And then we leave. And a lot of us don't talk to each other or to God until the following Sunday. Church, I don't know about you, but I'm so tired of church services. I've been going to church services my whole life, and I'll be honest, I got better things to do on a Sunday than a church service. I'm so sick of church services. What I want desperately on a Sunday morning is an encounter with the real living God who exists in this place that moves amongst his worshipers that, that I don't get to go there and get blessed, but that I come with the intention of blessing, blessing him and meeting him. have Pastor Randy and Ben come back up. I'm going to close out a little different this week. When I look at how church was done when people were actually around Jesus, it's vastly different than how we do it. When I look at how people worshiped when they were in the presence of Jesus, it's so much more desperate than it is now. But we believe that he's here, don't we? We believe he's alive. As I was reflecting on this this week, I thought about the story of the woman with the bleeding problem and how she crawls and fights through the crowd. She is so desperate about just touching Jesus. She knows that if she can just touch Jesus, everything will be better. She crawls through the crowd and she's so desperate that Jesus, when being touched by her, he stops everything and he says, who just touched me? 
and he's in the middle of a crowd. And the disciples are like, there's a lot of people here, Jesus. A lot of people just touched you. And he's like, no, somebody was reaching for me. Somebody was reaching to touch me. And I think about Sunday mornings and how many times we come in. How many times are we coming in desperately reaching for Jesus? And how many times are we just the crowd that shows up? We're just the crowd that's there to see Jesus, to get a little bit of advice from him or to get a little cute quip to write down. How many times do we show up desperately reaching towards him? Desperate for what it is he wants to do in our lives. As I was studying for this sermon, I came across Ephesians 3 in a sermon that somebody did on it, that Francis Chan did on it. And he pointed something out that I'd never seen in this passage before, and it's changed the way I look at worship probably forever. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. This is the letter to the church at Ephesus. Paul starts by saying, I will never not be thankful for you and your faith in Jesus Christ. So keep this in mind. He's speaking to believers. And he prays we would have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be feel, filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. Did you catch that? Let's go back to verse 18. So actually, let's, let's go to uh, 17. Pull up 17 real quick so we can put this into context. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Let's leave that verse up for a second. Paul is speaking to believers. The church at Ephesus. Grateful, again, he starts the book by saying he's grateful for the faith that they have in Jesus Christ our Lord. But now he's saying that he's praying that God would give them the power to know the love that surpasses knowledge. that they would know how deep and long and wide the love of Christ is. Paul is saying that you can be saved and still not really understand the love of Christ. You can be a follower. He's thankful for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but he doesn't think that they truly get it. In fact, he says that he prays God would give them the strength to be able to grasp a love that's unknowable. How do you know something that is beyond knowledge? I see Paul write about this and immediately I think about what church looks like on Sunday mornings. I think about our worship and I have to ask, do I know that love that Paul is talking about? I'm saved but do I understand how wide and deep and vast the love of Christ is? Or would Paul be praying for me on knees? If you look at verse 16, we don't have to pull it up. Leave that one up for now. 
If you look at verse 16, he says that he bends at his knee before the God whom everyone has their name. All families are created under God. He's literally saying he is on his knees begging God that he would give us the power to understand how much Christ loves us. And I look back at the examples, the worship that we talked about, Paul and Silas being in jail, the widow's offering, David and everything that he did, even in his brokenness, we see a theme running through all of these. The reason they're so desperate is because they get it. They get how much Christ loves them. They get how much he has looked past. They get how rich in mercy our God is. So this is what I want to close out with this morning. We're going to go into a quiet time. Pastor Andy's going to sing over us, and you can feel free to join him in worship if you want to, but I also want to challenge you to ask yourself this morning, do I really, really know how deep and long and wide and vast Christ's love is? Am I desperately reaching out to him because I get how much he has looked past to love me? Am I desperately reaching for him or is this just another church service? As we go into this time, I'm going to ask you all to stand up so that you're a little more comfortable to move if you need to move. But I want to challenge you to not leave this room this morning without asking for prayer if you don't know that you know, not that you're saved, but that you understand a love that is beyond knowledge. Not that you can answer all the questions correctly. This isn't a knowledge that you'll be tested on, but that you understand past knowledge how much Christ's love is here for us. matters my one desire is to worship you I live to worship you I live I live to worship you Thank you. 
away from the noise along with you. Away, away, hear your voice and to meet with you. Nothing else matters. My one desire is to worship you. I live to worship you. I live, I live to worship you. Second Chronicles, chapter 31, verse 21. It's talking about Hezekiah. And all that he did in the service of the temple of God and in his efforts to follow God's laws and commands. Hear this very carefully. Hezekiah sought his God wholeheartedly. And all that he did in the service of the temple of God and in his efforts to follow God's laws and commands, Hezekiah sought his God wholeheartedly. And I think what we do is a lot of times we read over things like that and then we go to, as a result, he was very successful. As a result, he prospered. As a result, life was good. (laughs) 
I think we would do well to chew on that word this week. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? What does that mean for us? Because I, I, I can back Ron up on this one. I am sick and tired of church services. I've been doing this for 50 plus years and I am tired of church. But I am okay with meeting with people where God shows up. I, I'm really okay with that. But for that to happen, for that to happen, for that to happen, those people that are meeting together must seek after him wholeheartedly. That's the prerequisite. You want to see God show up? You want to see people get saved? You want to see people get healed and restored? You want to see an amazing act of God's grace? Then let's serve him, honor him, worship him. And, you know, I think even going back to the beginning and talking about just all the financial stuff and everything, I, you know, a lot of times we, we get bogged down with that. You know, I do. Uh, do you do that? You get bogged down with finances? You know, you get bogged down with the stress of life and go to the grocery store and you can't find celery that's worth snot. <laughs> I don't know about you, but we've been buying celery all summer long and it's awful. And yet you still pay the price for it. You know, we, we just grumble, we complain, we grumble, we complain, we grumble, compl Lord, thank you that we have celery to eat. And I have to do this all the time. i got to self-check myself. I'm telling you, I can get into a nasty place real quick. Those of us that battle kind of chronic pain and things like that, it happens fast. I mean, it's just a, it's like a meter that goes and pegs in seconds. I have to constantly check myself and go, hmm, okay, I did wake up today. Hmm, still married. Hmm, got pretty good kids. Hmm, grandkids aren't bad. Hmm, serving a good church. Hmm, still living in peace, even though it's a little shaky. Hmm, still worshiping in freedom. Wow. Wow. Had a house over my head? Do we have a car to drive? Doesn't have AC, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> you, you hear what I'm saying? Hezekiah sought his God wholeheartedly. What was the result? He was successful. I think we have to be careful about that successful word because we'd like to really define that in our own terms, right? W wouldn't we like to just put in our definition of what success means? Okay, so let's just serve him wholeheartedly and let him define what success is, okay? Because I guarantee you part of the success would be that souls are being transformed. We're, we're being sanctified and life is changing and we are progressing and moving forward in the work of God. Again, I want that done, but whether that gets done or not. Prosperity in the kingdom of God really does boil down to lives being changed. Father, thank you. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the worship. Gosh, I guess just thank you for a lot of things, huh? You are faithful. You are good. To one day gather around the throne with that endless praise and just say worthy, worthy, faithful, faithful you are. May it become a little bit of a burden on our souls this week about the wholeheartedly thing what that means for us because I think some of us need to do a check on that for others in the circumstances we praise you and we worship you and we give our very best to you pray all
love us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you for being here. Welcome back, Kennedy. Tomatoes. Yeah, and Aunt Abby too, and Evan. Yep, 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 yep. Yep, Evan, Abby. Anybody else been?